It's a joy to be here in Hamilton. This is my first time I've ever been to Hamilton. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Reichel showed me around a little bit today. What a beautiful city, geographically, on the lake and the mountain up on high and everything. And also it's a pleasure for me to be at St. Nicholas Serbian Orthodox Church. I have a great love and respect for our Serbian church history and tradition. So on a personal level for me, this is a very special occasion. And our first topic today is going to focus on the virtue of love within our spiritual lives. And more specifically, love as our path to holiness. And then during our second talk, we'll be discussing the practice of prayer. Since prayer is the ultimate expression of love. And also, uh, you have some handouts there. There's going to be many patristic quotes I'll be referring to and from holy elders. So if you want to follow along some of the quotes, feel free. And also, I'm just getting over a bit of a cold, so if I have to grab a sip of water every now and then, you'll have to please forgive me for that. I hope it's not going to be too distracting. <clears throat> but before beginning, I'd like to share just a few general remarks about the apparent popularity of spirituality today. Because it's interesting to observe that within the lives of many throughout the world, there's a significant increase of interest in spiritual life. Many people are seeking a personal experience of God, and they desire a tangible and a dynamic experience of His presence within their daily lives. And furthermore, many today are trying to satisfy this inner need through a variety of methods and means. The recent growth of the various pseudo-Christian cults and other such religious groups bears witness to this change in attitudes. And the steady interest in spirituality, whether from the near, middle, or far east, this is also another indication of the spiritual thirst of contemporary man. And another clear manifestation of this inner human need, with completely negative results, is the rising popularity of satanic and occult practices, as well as neo-pagan rituals and witchcraft and other such ceremonies, of New Age religious movements. And if we add to this the tremendous interest today of anything even remotely connected with the world of psychic phenomena, we see that the need for some kind of communion with the divine becomes most obvious. At times it seems as if modern man is searching frantically for God. In this widespread search for spiritual life, no matter how flawed or misguided, it reveals the fact that there is an innate desire for participation in divine life that is basic to the human being. Indeed, this is exactly the reason why man was created. Life in communion with God is man's natural orientation. And when this spiritual need is not satisfied through conventional means, then its fulfillment will be sought elsewhere. And at the same time, we also see an increasing number of conscientious Christian believers who are finding true inner fulfillment in Orthodox spiritual life. There are many sincere and dedicated believers who are no longer satisfied with the static state of spiritual life offered by many Western denominations today. They're searching for a different and a deeper spiritual life in Christ. And this inner search reveals a general discontent with the vast changes that are prevalent in the church practices or in the ethical values and other traditionally accepted theological teachings of many of these Western Christian confessions. And this is why so many are seeking out the Orthodox Christian truth concerning the salvation of man. They're growing wary and alienated from some of these Western confessions while becoming interested in a more spiritual relationship with Christ. And there are those who are coming to appreciate the fact that there exists another Christian teaching that differs from the conventional denominations of the West. And more than a few are coming into contact with the spirituality of the Orthodox Church and the teachings of the Eastern Christian tradition which offers a much more profound Christ-centered spiritual life. Because our Orthodox Church challenges the believer to reach beyond the common conception of salvation that predominates in the West. 
For the Orthodox Church, salvation is more than the pardon of sins and transgressions. Salvation is more than being justified or acquitted for offenses committed against God. According to Orthodox teaching, salvation certainly includes forgiveness and justification, but by no means is it limited to them. For the Orthodox Church, salvation is the acquisition of the grace of the Holy Spirit. To be saved is to be sanctified and to participate in the divine life of God, or as the Apostle Peter writes, to become partakers of divine nature. So we see that forgiveness of sins is not the end of salvation. It's only the beginning. It should lead ultimately to true knowledge of God and to the gift of love for all mankind. In the words of St. Siloan of Mount Athos, he says, I began to beseech God for forgiveness, and he granted me not only forgiveness, but also the Holy Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit, I knew God. The Lord remembered not my sins, and he gave me to love people. And my soul longs for the whole world to be saved and delight in the love of God. So this is one reason why so many people are attracted to the Orthodox faith. Because our church gives guidance on how we are to base our life in Christ. And she reveals to us man's true spiritual potential. As is exemplified in the words of Holy Scripture. But as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So this process of becoming holy is also referred to as sanctification or deification, or we could also refer to it as theosis. And all these terms are synonymous and they can be used interchangeably. So the term theosis then could be defined basically as a process. It's a spiritual process whereby through participation in divine grace, man is sanctified or deified. And in this way, through divine grace, and as we shall see through divine love, man becomes holy. That is to say, man becomes Christ-like. We're all called to become like God. However, before proceeding to a discussion on our Orthodox teaching concerning theosis or our participation in divine grace, it'll be helpful to discuss just a few preliminary points. First of all, the patristic understanding of human nature teaches that man was created to participate in divine life, in the life of God. And this is the essential meaning of the scriptural account of the creation of man from Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So this passage from the book of Genesis, it conveys the fundamental truth that man is a spiritual being and that the true meaning of human existence is understood only in its proper spiritual perspective. So the ultimate meaning of life is seen only in light of man's relationship with God. And according to the Orthodox view, God grants man the potential to participate through grace in his holy and divine life. And this is why we were created. We were created to be vessels of divine grace. And apart from this life and divine grace, we become something that we were not originally intended to be. So when we declare our independence from our creator, we restrict ourselves to a secular life that's separated from God. And then we forfeit not only our theosis or our sanctification, we also fail to comprehend the fundamental purpose of our existence. So communion with God and participation in divine grace, these are what constitute man's natural environment. This is our natural way of life. It's precisely the, the divine image and the presence of divine grace that distinguish man from the animal kingdom. St. Siloan writes, and this is a quote from the handouts. He says, How infirm is the soul. Without God's grace, we are like cattle. But with grace, great is man in the sight of God. And St. Gregory of Sinai also adds, and I quote, 
Through trespasses, we have become akin to beasts and have lost the natural blessings given us by God, becoming as beasts instead of reasoning beings and animals instead of divine. So we are created, therefore, and we're called to grow into the fullness of divine likeness. However, although we have fallen from our original splendor, and in spite of the fact that we're now born into a state of sinful inclination, we still retain that image of God in which we were originally created. So the goal of Orthodox spiritual life, therefore, is not only to restore the image of God, but it's also to attain to theosis or divine likeness. In other words, to become like God in Christ. So man was not originally created in a state of completed perfection. He was, however, endowed with the unique freedom to choose. We can choose to either live in pursuit of achieving our full potential, or else we are free to digress toward the desecration of our true dignity as human beings. Only through the proper use of our God-given freedom can we cooperate with divine grace in restoring the image of God within us and attain to likeness with God, or this holiness for which we were created. So for the Orthodox Church, the ultimate goal of man is theosis, or deification. We're called to become partakers of divine nature. And this is understood as participation in divine grace. So this orthodox teaching on theosis, or the sanctification of man, this is a decisive point of difference between the divergent views of salvation that distinguish our Eastern Orthodox tradition from the non-Orthodox West. So, with all this talk of holiness and theosis and man's deification, well, it sounds interesting, huh? We still have to ask the question, what does all this have to do with me? All this abstract theological theory sounds good and everything, but how is someone like me supposed to apply this to my daily life? Most of us find it difficult enough as we struggle with our own day-to-day -day problems and circumstances. Can we too really expect to participate in divine life and actually become like Christ? And if so, just how is someone like you and me living in contemporary society? How are we supposed to go about it? Does the Lord really expect average believers like us to attain to such a lofty goal as participating in divine life and actually become like God? Well, obviously, the answer is yes. And the fathers of our church offer much practical advice on how we are to conduct our lives as we struggle to acquire the grace of the Holy Spirit and as we try to grow in theosis. And their guidance and their advice is certainly relevant to the conditions in which we live today. We could go on at length about the role of ascetic practice, about the importance of prayer, about fasting. We could talk about the process of purification from our passions, we could talk about the significance of participation in the liturgical and sacramental life of the church, the virtue of keeping the commandments. We could talk about the value of reading Holy Scripture. We could go on and on. And all these are very important for our spiritual lives because they open up the way toward theosis and they lead to the fullness of our life in Christ. However, there is one thing, there's one element there's one virtue that is so fundamental to our lives in Christ and to our hope for salvation and sanctification that without it, everything else we may try to do will remain fruitless. And it's the mark of the true disciple of Christ. It's that which sets Christianity apart from every other religion of the world. And this one thing that's so necessary, this foundation and this most important aspect of our lives as Christians is, of course, nothing other than love. It's this message of love that characterizes our Christian faith. Our Lord himself proclaims the crucial role of love within the lives of his followers. 
the Lord teaches, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In St. John the Apostle, he also emphasizes, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So this emphasis on love is of central significance to the gospel of Christ. In fact, the gospel itself is ultimately a message of love. In the fundamental teaching of the New Testament, perhaps all of Orthodox theology, it can be summed up in those three simple words. God is love. The God of the Christians, that is the Holy Trinity, is referred to as the God of love. Indeed, love is the basic characteristic of the life of the Holy Trinity because the three divine persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are one. They're of the same essence. They're of the same nature. And they're united in their perfect love for one another. So this is the fundamental truth of the mystery of the Holy Trinity. God is a unity of persons living in perfect love. And God is love. And love presupposes another person. And man, as created in the image and likeness of God, he's created to share in and to live in love. God is love. And the more man loves, the more he participates in divine life. So love is thus innate in man. Love is basic to our very being. And it's through love that we attain to divine likeness and realize our true personhood. Love makes man truly human. And love makes man divine. So in this light, we see that it is love that deifies man. It is love that makes man Christ-like, and it is love that makes man like God. And St. Siloan writes, the more perfect the love, the holier the life. And one of the writers from the Philokalia, he even uses the term deifying love. On the other hand, without love, we distort the divine image in which we are created. And the less we love, the more we alienate ourselves from divine life. So the importance of love for the life of man is revealed in Christ's double commandment of love. Our Lord was asked, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, says the Lord, hang all the law and the prophets. So these commandments of Christ, therefore, they're commandments of love. However, in reality, it's not a question of two separate commandments. They're both directly interrelated and they're interdependent on one another. They form a single life. Without love for God... It's impossible to love one's neighbor. And without love for one's neighbor, it's impossible to truly love God. And St. John the theologian, he emphasizes this point when he writes, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, how can he love God? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So we see then that the love for one's neighbor is the criterion of one's true love for God. The love of the Holy Trinity, that is to say the love that's shared between the three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it forms the foundation on which man's love for his fellow man is modeled. The love that we share with each other and the love that we feel for each other here on earth, it's only a glimpse it's only a shadow, and it's only a foretaste of the true and genuine and divine love, which is our God, the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So man, as created in the image and likeness of the Holy Trinity, we thus have an innate need to live for and to love other people. 
both in the context of our family life, as well as in regard to our relationships with our friends. We all live for love. We all long for love, and we're all looking for love. Indeed, love is essential to our lives as human beings. But the problem is, sometimes we settle for the wrong kind of love. Sometimes we settle for the wrong kind of relationships. The Lord commands his followers to love one another. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. However, the Lord's commandments, these are not just simply an ethical teaching that might help society to operate or, or function more smoothly. Rather, his commandments of love reveal the true inner nature of man. So when the Lord proclaims, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, he reveals the truth that one's neighbor is organically linked to one's own being. One's neighbor, that is to say the other person, forms an integral component of our own human person. And one's neighbor, or in the original Greek, the word is plision, it means literally the one next to you. It play, the guy next to you plays a very fundamental role in our own personal life as human beings. So the Lord's commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself, it means that if we really want to experience the fullness of human life, you have to love the guy next to you just as much as we love ourselves. Otherwise, we're not truly human because then we're not living in the image and likeness of God. So through love for our neighbor, we fulfill the true purpose of our life. And the commandments of Christ manifest the truth that love is the way of God, and indeed love is the way toward God. St. Maximus the Confessor, he writes, Do not disdain the commandment to love, because by it you will become a son of God. So, at this point, as we look deeper into how our Orthodox Church considers love as the way toward holiness or theosis, and as we focus on the teaching of St. Siloan of Mount Athos, and together with him, his disciple, Elder Sophroni, we're going to see how their particular teaching seems to encapsulate the whole unique Orthodox perspective on this profound mystery of love. Both St. Siloan and Elder Sophroni taught that by following the commandment to love one's neighbor, the believer is led toward likeness with Christ. For example, Elder Sophroni says, there's no difference between the commandments of Christ and the life of God himself. There's no difference between the commandments of Christ, these commandments of love, and the life of God himself, he says. By abiding in Christ's commandments, we organically become like him. On the other hand, St. Siloan teaches that if one hates his neighbor or if one hates his brother, it reveals that he has made his heart a dwelling place for an evil spirit. And he stresses that without love for one's fellow man, life will lose its proper orientation and life can become oppressive then and it will become difficult to endure without love. And to prove his point, St. Siloan suggests to his readers that they try living without brotherly love. He says, go ahead and try it for even one day in order to experience firsthand the profound difference that love makes in the daily life of man. So it's in accordance with these sayings wherein love for one's neighbor is seen as the basic feature of our lives as human beings that St. Siloan said so simply, but so profoundly, he said, our brother is our life. Now, five such simple words. Our brother is our life. So we have to ask ourselves, just what is this brotherly love? And what exactly is, is required to share in it? It's interesting to note how St. Siloan taught that to truly love one's neighbor, it entails much pain and much suffering and much compassion. And he refers to this clearly when he writes, the greater the love, the greater the sufferings of the soul. 
According to Elder Sophroni, he says it's impossible to love without suffering. And he describes love as the most painful, the most difficult, and the most challenging spiritual endeavor the believer will ever undertake. He taught that true love is compassionate and it is perfected through suffering. The more a man suffers on account of love, the more he becomes Christ-like by participating in Christ's all-compassionate love for man. Because true Christ-like love identifies personally with the suffering of one's neighbor to the point where he who loves makes the pain of the other his own. So when one suffers out of love for one's neighbor, it leads to participation in the suffering of all mankind. And this in turn evolves into Christ-like love for all mankind, whereby one comes to experience the inherent and the natural unity of the entire human race. Because we're all one. We're all members of the same family, the family of man. So your very own Personal experience of pain or of grief or of suffering cannot be considered as somehow separate or cut off from the common tragedy of fallen human nature as a whole. Because all of us human beings, we all share in the same consequences of the fall of Adam. And just as all are called to share in the same saving and the same sanctifying grace of the life in Christ, we're all called to be one. We all share in the same suffering. When one begins to see the daily drama of the pain and the suffering of our neighbor through the eyes of Christ, then we come to see the tragic consequences of fallen humanity in a new light. Because then the saints, the holy elders, they they come to agonize over and they experience within themselves the personal pain and suffering of every human being, just like Christ himself does. Elder Sophroni, he writes, Where there is great love, the heart necessarily suffers and feels pity for every creature. And he teaches that by identifying with and sharing in the common suffering of mankind, we come to acquire a truly Christian consciousness. We come to participate in Christ's own undying and eternal love for each and every human person. If you can do that, you become holy. You become like Christ. And just as Christ loves all mankind, so too every human being is called to do the same, to love all mankind. So who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor then? Our neighbor is, in fact, every member of the human race. We're all united by the fact that we all share the same human nature. The same human nature that was united to God in the person of the incarnate Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So our neighbor is indeed every man. This is the neighbor whom Christ commands his followers to love as thyself. And such love is not restricted to one's own family or to friends or to fellow parishioners or other Christians. Christ commands the believer to love every human being. This is the true Christian way. St. Maximus the Confessor, he writes, Be as eager as you can to love every man. The friends of Christ love everyone sincerely, he says. And this does not refer to something abstract or theoretical. Rather, it's on a personal level. In this way, the believer comes to comprehend and to appreciate the eternal value and the precious uniqueness of every single human person. So in the words of Elder Sophroni, he says, We see in others that which our own spiritual experiences has shown us about ourselves. Whoever has experienced how deep and intense the suffering of the human spirit can be has no doubt that every human being is a permanent eternal value. He says, we can become conscious of man's worth, conscious that the least of these, my brethren, is very dear in the sight of Christ. So for St. Silouan, this true and this compassionate Christ-like love for all mankind, it leads the believer to grieve 
for the salvation of every human person, just as if he was grieving, grieving for his own salvation. St. Siloan, his, he writes, love cannot suffer a single soul to perish. That's the kind of love he attained to. It cannot suffer a single soul to perish. And basically what he's saying here is that true love cannot bear to see any human being suffering in hell. Therefore, when he says our brother is our life, St. Siloan is actually implying that all mankind, indeed every human person, is truly our neighbor and our brother and our life. And he stresses how it's only the Holy Spirit who teaches this true Christ-like love and Christ-like compassion. Such love and compassion lead ultimately to Christ-like sorrow for those who are not being saved. In St. Maximus, he offers an additional point. If that wasn't enough, he states repeatedly that not only is the true disciple called to love everyone, but get this, we must love each and every person equally. Can you do that? In imitation of the perfect love of Christ for all mankind, God loves all of his children equally. He doesn't like the Orthodox more than the non-Orthodox or the non-Christians. He loves each of his children equally. Can we do the same? That's why only a few of us become saints and holy. There's one final aspect of St. Siloan's teaching on how love leads to holiness. And this deserves our attention, and this is very relevant and practical, and it's most applicable for all of us here today. And this is the special emphasis that he places on love for enemies. This theme is fundamental to our Lord's entire teaching, huh? Love your enemy. To begin with, the commandment of Christ to love thy enemy is not found in any other religion of the world. It's unique to Christianity alone. And as compared to the commandments of the Old Testament, this commandment of Jesus Christ, it appears revolutionary. It's opposite, in fact, to the prescription of the Mosaic Law. Doesn't our Lord himself proclaim? You have heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So love for enemies thus characterizes the true disciples of Christ. Before discussing this aspect, uh, especially in the teaching of St. Siloan, we have to first ask ourselves, well, who exactly is this enemy whom Christ is commanding us to love? Is one supposed to understand the word enemy in a common everyday sense of the term? Is an outright antagonist or, or a rival? Or maybe there's a deeper, more spiritual understanding of this word. The Lord himself refers to an enemy as anyone who strikes us, anyone who sues us, anyone who forces us against our will or persecutes us. In many cases, however, an enemy is not necessarily the common adversary or antagonist. Rather, an enemy is he who is the source of our particular spiritual trial or temptation. Let me repeat that. An enemy is he who is the source of a particular spiritual trial or a temptation. So an enemy thus strikes us and persecutes us, not only physically, but also, and perhaps more often than not, he wounds with words. And this could be both intentional as well as unintentional. An enemy... And this specific context is therefore not your typical adversary, antagonist, or your outright rival. It's not the Taliban or ISIS. 
In this particular sense, an enemy is he, whether he's aware of it or not, who may be the source of a spiritual trial or a temptation or a tribulation which afflicts us and which causes us grief or sorrow. So many times, it is he with whom one has a close and personal relationship who is often perceived as this kind of a spiritual enemy. And this is indeed the person whom the Lord calls us to love. So the person, whether intentionally or not, who makes us suffer and makes us feel scorned and despised, who might hurt our feelings to the point where we become angry and even hateful, he who makes us feel sorrowful or grieved, this is exactly the enemy who is to be loved. And this would include members of our own families, our relatives, sometimes our friends, fellow members of a parish community, as well as those with whom one is sacramentally linked or has spiritual bonds, even our clergy and their families, colleagues, co-workers, fellow students. It seems as if the most difficult, the most fierce, and the humbling of the inner conflicts of spiritual warfare they stem from one's personal relationships with the people with whom we are closest to. And St. Silouan also refers to this broader and more spiritual definition of an enemy. And he includes as an enemy anyone who offends you, anyone with whom you are angry, anyone you condemn or detest, as well as anyone with whom you are not reconciled, also anyone with whom you find fault with, anyone you look upon with an unkind eye. For St. Siloan then, in this particular sense, this spiritual sense, our enemy is anyone with whom we are angry, anyone we despise or detest, anyone we find fault with, anyone with whom we are not reconciled. So with so much importance attached to this theme of love for enemies, we have to naturally ask the next question, well, just what exactly did St. Siloan mean by this word love? Just what really is this love for enemies? The word love, it's so freely and frequently used, it might take on a variety of diverse meanings. For St. Siloan and for our church fathers in general, love is not a simple sentimental emotion. Nor can love be reduced to the mere tolerance of another person. Neither is love for enemies a show of nonviolence, nor is it a not returning evil for evil, nor is love an attitude of neutrality. That's not what love is. Love is not the mere absence of hatred. True love is an effort to do good to someone who hates you. Often in the effort to do good to an enemy, we may assume that we have to go to great lengths in order to show our love, in order to prove our love. However, it's not the outward showing or proving of love that matters most. Love is proven to be true when it instills inner peace within the heart of an enemy. That's what love is. This is the genuine mark of love. When out of sheer compassion, one tries to instill peace and calm into the heart of another human person, especially one of our so-called enemies. This is not accomplished through gifts and through pomp and through ceremony. According to St. Maximus, it's accomplished, how? Through simple words, through a humble attitude, and through a gentle demeanor, he says. St. Siloan refers to love for enemies as the compassion of a loving heart. However, love cannot be confined to the emotion of compassion. Because love is not an emotion, love is action. 
And the Lord himself urges the believer into action. He teaches, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. He says, bless those who curse you. He says, pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. From him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. He says, give to everyone who asks of you. So the Lord here, he's presenting love as action, as doing good, as blessing, as praying, as offering, as giving. Clearly, Christ commands the believer to respond to and to react to an enemy with good and positive acts. So love for enemies is not simply a show of neutrality. It entails a positive reaction and an active response. Paradoxically, it might also be said, it's not so much what one does that reveals your love. Sometimes it's what one does not do and does not say that truly shows genuine concern for the inner peace of an enemy. The truth and the integrity behind the believer's actions is manifested by his not returning evil for evil, such as not returning angry words or a haughty attitude or a disturbing look or any other type of aggressive remarks. When the believer, out of concern for the inner peace of a so-called enemy, does not react with scorn and with hatred, and when he does not attempt revenge, then he's on his way toward truly loving as the Lord commands him to do. And there are other practical methods and techniques that are used in actively loving an enemy. Our church fathers, they're very practical. St. Maximus recommends the believer to never speak ill of an enemy to anyone. He also advises that by dwelling on the good things of the past, one can more easily cast out the hatred that might be present today. St. Simeon, the new theologian, he teaches we should always think positively. Try to remain calm. Try to control one's anger. They sound like they're speaking from their own personal experience here. And another important element in loving one's enemy is the ability to forgive him. And this is especially significant for St. Siloan, who writes, If you forgive your brother the offense he puts upon you, and if you love your enemies then you will receive forgiveness for your sins, and the Lord will give you to know the love of the Holy Spirit. So true love occurs when we not only forgive, but also when we can forget and no longer dwell on the past offenses. It's not enough, therefore, to just forgive someone for the sins that he may have committed against us. We also have to forget them, just as the Lord also forgives not only does he forgive us he also forgets our sins can we do the same saint john chrysostom writes there's nothing more grievous than the remembrance of past injuries so to be willing to forget completely even to the point of covering up over what one may have suffered in the past this is the mark of true christ-like love for St. Siloan, however, love for enemies is identified above all else. Love is, for enemies is prayer. Prayer is the ultimate expression of true love. You don't get any higher than prayer. To love your enemy is to pray for him. And even more exactly, it's to pray for his salvation in Christ. So in this light, St. Siloan offers his own definition of true love. And he writes... And I quote from the handout. He says, The soul sorrows for her enemies and prays for them because they have strayed from the truth. That is love for our enemies. And he writes elsewhere, The Lord is love, and he gave the Holy Spirit on earth, who teaches the soul to love her enemies and to pray for them, that they too may find salvation. That is true love, he says. So St. Siloan states clearly, therefore, that love for enemies is prayer for their personal salvation in Christ. That's how you love your enemy, to pray for their salvation. 
In St. Isaac the Syrian, he's even more specific about praying for your enemies. He refers to it as praying for their protection and also praying that they can receive mercy from God. So love for enemies that's commanded by Christ, it, it cannot be reduced to simple passiveness or nonviolence. It's an active response, and it's a compassionate prayer for their ultimate salvation. However, it must be pointed out, as St. Siloan teaches, this love does not depend on human endeavor alone. We can't do it alone as fallen human beings. He stresses that if someone does indeed love his enemies, it's due directly to the grace of the Holy Spirit. He writes, the Lord taught me to love my enemies. Without the grace of God, we cannot love our enemies because only the Holy Spirit teaches love. It's interesting to note how Elder Sophroni directly identifies love for enemies with divine light. He clearly considered love for enemies as a manifestation of grace. He says the bearer of such love is the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. He's the brother and a friend of Christ. He's a son of God. He's a God through grace. In this light, the Lord's own words spoken to his holy apostles can be taken quite literally. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So, the more we imitate Christ by loving our enemies, the more we will truly know Christ and participate in his divine life. We not only believe in Christ and in the sanctification of human nature, but we come to live the life in Christ through Christ-like love. And among the spiritual fruits obtained through love for enemies, St. Siloan includes the gift of true inner peace. He says, if we love our enemies, peace will dwell in us day and night. And he teaches that even though we may pray and fast, if we fail to love our enemies, we will never have peace within our soul. And according to St. Siloan, he who carries the peace of the Holy Spirit within him will automatically spread peace to those around him. Furthermore, he teaches that he who gives peace to others will also be given peace, and indeed much more than he originally gave. In a world that's clamoring and protesting for peace, and among all the violence and hatred that seem to saturate our society, this particular message of peace is especially relevant today. Because there's going to be no peace in the world, neither in society nor within our own families, if man does not first acquire the peace of our Lord within his own soul. And this peace must first begin inwardly within one's own soul, and only then can it flow outwardly toward one's fellow man thereby affecting the communities in which we live and by extension our society as a whole. And herein lies the relevance of St. Siloan's teaching on love for enemies. Because our so-called enemies, therefore, they should be seen in more of a spiritual and in a more positive light. Because our enemy is in reality a unique opportunity for us to attain by God's grace to our salvation, to our sanctification to our holiness in Christ. In reality, these enemies that we have in our lives, they're our way toward participation in divine love. Love for our enemies opens the way to our communion with Christ and indeed our communion with all mankind. An enemy is an opportunity that we should actually cherish. He's not an opponent that should be scorned. And the more we participate in the philanthropic love of Christ for all mankind, the more we will come to appreciate the unique worth that Christ places on each and every human person, and this includes our so-called enemies. And this is the ultimate manifestation of the life in Christ. This is what it means to be alive in Christ. It's to acquire the same consciousness as Christ, the same compassion as Christ, and the same desire that Christ has for the salvation of each and every human person, including 
our enemies. So to conclude, through his participation in divine love, St. Silouan experienced directly its deifying effects. He experienced in the most profound way the inherent unity of all mankind. And seeing his brother as his own life, St. Silouan prayed for the salvation of others even more than he prayed for himself. And this is where his love, and this is where his life in Christ ultimately led him. He became Christ-like. He participated personally in Christ-like love, in Christ-like compassion, and in Christ-like prayer for the salvation of all mankind. And if we too can learn to love our enemies, we too can become like Saint Siloan. Through love, we too can become like Christ. But such a high and exalted degree of love, however, it's rarely found today, Many people talk about love. Many people are looking for love. But few see this spiritual significance of this divine mystery. And although many different philosophies and religions, as well as the countless poets and playwrights throughout history, they all offer their own perspectives on this mysterious nature of love, none share the truth provided by our holy Orthodox Church. And I end with the words of St. Maximus the Confessor, who writes, Many people have said much about love, but only in seeking it among Christ's disciples will you find it. For only they have the true love, the teacher of love. Therefore, the one who possesses love, he says, possesses God himself, since God is love. Amen. And thank you for your patience. Zorka, you want to do any questions or? You want to just take them from the floor or however you want to do it, Zorka. And I don't have all the answers here. We have many experienced priests and pastors that might be able to offer some pastoral perspectives. Thank you. Should I forgive my enemy though he did not repent for the evil he has done to me? No. Don't do it. No. Well, how, do you, how do you forgive your enemy if he's not repenting? Was it, easier to, it would be easier to forgive him if he repented. What do you guys think? Should you forgive him or not if he doesn't repent? Yeah, we have to, right? I mean, that will might help him to repent. You know, I mean, anybody have any uh, a take on that? Yeah, of course. I mean, that would make it even easier. It would make it too easier if you only, if you only forgive someone when they... Re what kind of forgiveness is that? That's not Christ-like forgiveness. Christ forgives us even though we don't repent. What kind of healing would take place? When's the healing process going to start? Yes, we have to forgive our enemy, even though he does not repent. The healing process will start somewhere. He'll start repenting. He'll probably start feeling more sorrowful once he feels the peace that's coming from you and the non-judgment that's coming from you. Anything else anybody want to say about that? You want to say something about that? It's harder what? Yeah, what if they're continuing to do harm to you? There you go. Now, we're, how are you supposed to forgive someone who's continually doing this harm, who's continually making life difficult for you? How are you supposed to forgive them? Anybody have any advice on that? Ma'am? Through prayer. You know, the power of prayer. You, you pray and things, hearts, human hearts can soften. I think we all have experienced it in our lives. Unsurmountable problems, just relationships that have been broken, huh? they can be healed, but it takes prayer. It takes ultimately the prayer in one's own heart. And if you can still try to instill peace in that enemy who's continually making your life difficult, uh, they will feel the peace, they will feel the prayer, and they will feel the love. 
But on the other hand, what if you react with, with more scorn or aggressive remarks? Huh? What if, you don't, what if you ignore them and don't say hi or don't greet them when they walk by? That's only going to lead to a, a harder heart. So through prayer, prayer and trying to instill peace, you can, you can forgive an enemy who's continually making your life difficult. It's not easy at all, but that is, that is the way you become Christ-like. Hmm. How can I love somebody who committed horrible crimes against my people and my family? How can I love somebody? How, how are they supposed to love someone who's done that? Anybody? How can you love? How are you supposed to do that? Don't love him? What, is the, what would the Lord say? Can you still pray, as St. Silouan said? Can you still pray? Uh, yeah, you can still pray for his salvation in Christ. That they will come to their senses. huh? That they will feel a little remorse or repentance. We can still pray for their salvation. I believe Christ is calling us to pray for all those enemies. And not to, so that it heaps more coals upon their head, but so that they can soften their heart and find some kind of repentance. You know, in the end, we're all going to die. We're all going to come to the judgment seat. We're all going to meet Christ face to face. We're all going to have our remorse for our sins we've committed. Those in political power, think of the judgment on them, all the lives they're affecting by the decisions they make. So if you can find it in your heart to pray for even those people, that's how you can start to not hate. You want to love those people? Just try to start not judging them or hating them. It's going to be a long process, perhaps. If I know in my heart I don't love someone, and all that I can offer is forced outward action, is that acceptable to God? Would God then help me to love that person? How do you love someone whom you know in your heart you don't love? Huh? Pretend? That's what, huh? Can you, uh, can you pretend? Is that a way to start? It's a start. It's a start. It's at least you're pretending. At least you're not being, uh, you're being polite. You're pretending. You're trying to hold back your anger. You're trying to curb your tongue. I believe for many of us that you've got to start somewhere. Mother, you have a... Fake it until you make it. Fake it until you make it. No, I've heard that advice. At least put on. At least, at least we're not judging. At least we're not being angry. At least I'm not being spiteful or, or using angry words. I think. I mean, that's not the goal. That's not the greatest way. But we do have to start. Love is a process that's going to continue and grow, right? So start somewhere, and by pretending, at least you're holding back angry words. At least I'm holding back an, a haughty look, or an unkind eye. As St. Silla once said. A few more here. Oh, man. Jeepers. Zorka, you want to? Yeah, I better get your okay here to say this one. Maybe one of the priests here. Pastoral question. Do you want to go there? Here's another one. I don't know. Ask the, ask, the pre, ask the elder priest here. Does love and forgiveness imply or require participation in sin? No. Or keeping company with corrupt people? Or denial or compromise of our faith? Does love and forgiveness imply keeping company with corrupt people? Does that mean you have to go out to lunch with these people to love them and to socialize with them, a so-called enemy, or to compromise our faith? I don't think we doesn't require that. How are you supposed to love a, a, an enemy like that? What does that mean? Does that does love mean I got to you know hang out and socialize and huh? Maybe not. Hopefully you might be able to get there. But again, as we say, yeah, okay. okay um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Again, praying, instilling peace. Huh? Yeah, who are the... That's a good point. Can you hear? Maybe you should stand up. Huh? He said Christ ate with the publicans. He went in with the tax collectors and was in the company of prostitutes. Does that mean... Where do we find the balance here? And he, also, he, said very clearly, he says it's not what we eat that corrupts us, it's what comes out of our mouth. You know, it, can you sit down? Some people dis, detest the other person's presence. Huh? You have, has anyone ever had such angry, anger in their heart huh? towards someone else that just the, the sight or the presence of that person is revulsive. You don't want to be in the same room with that person. Has anybody ever experienced that level of anger? Or is that just a Greek thing? I don't know. <laughs> now serves. No serves. You're Greek? No, I mean, you know, so there's levels of healing. Sometimes some people just aren't ready to sit down face to face or to talk. Huh? Don't we know this? Don't we have to work toward the healing? in slow ways because just as a heart might be melting it might just lead to hardness of heart i don't know are we that's the lord's commandment that's the lord's example that he gave us but i mean we should know our own limits right know your own limits you know it starts with prayer and it ends with prayer and it and we want to instill peace in the other person if i'm not ready to come to terms and make up with Reiko. I don't want to have to, we'll just go further apart if we, if we try to mend things before their time. Maybe I'm not ready. Maybe he's not ready. So certainly not to compromise our faith, to keep company with corrupt people. Huh? Are you that strong that you won't fall into the temptation? Know your limits. Drug dealers, gangsters, prostitutes, gangsters. Drug dealers, you know, if I'm dealing with an addiction and my old friend is a drug dealer and I got to love my, so I'm going to go hang out with them and go drive around with them and go to parties with them, I'll, I'll fall again perhaps. Father? Well, I was just saying, I think that's what uh, John Kribikus is talking about in the, in the, in the latter. When he says it's, it's uh, a fault of a, the beginner to take too much to themselves. Very nice, you guys. We're leaving the spiritual father out. That's why we have spiritual fathers to go for guidance. Because they can help us. You can't do this on your own. Huh? You can't do any of this on your own. We need advice. We need direction. We need confession. And then we take the advice of our spiritual father. And he'll, he'll know better than we do where we're at. And what our capabilities are. You guys, here's the difficult one here. Forgive and forget... What about pedophiles? Wouldn't it be stupid to forget? Okay, what do we do with that one? Do you forget? We can try to forgive a pedophile. huh? And you want to make a personal say it's someone who did something to one of our own family. Can you forgive that? Forget? Are you kidding? What does that mean to forget? What, what would we do there? Does anybody have any advice on, on this one? If you dwell on it, it's not going to make it better, number one. Okay, Father, did you have something to say, please, and talk loud? There's a difference, can anybody hear? There's a difference what the law has to do and what we have to do. I mean, someone who's going to continually, you know, if we want to go to the ultimate sickness, the pedophile thing, I mean, we have to forgive and forget, but are we going to say, okay, you, don't be watchful or cautious or precautious? Huh? I don't think that's right either. We can try to, try to forgive. We can... You, you know, what do you forget there? What are we trying to forget at that point? Does anybody have any insight? The what? We're trying to forget the, the injury caused, not necessarily forget that that person is trying to do 
that this person has a problem. We can't forget that, but we can try to, you know, forgive the, the sins committed and the injuries. But we have to be cautious and wise, huh? Michael? Hate the sin, not the person. You hear that oftentimes, that phrase, huh? Yes? Yeah, you can't just forget completely, oh, it never happened. I mean, what, that's not very responsible, is it? For a mother just to forget, okay, Uncle Bob, forget, he's okay, he's going to go fishing again with the kids. What, what are we supposed to forget there or forgive or forget? Huh? We try to help them, you know, that, that seeing him in that, in that way, perhaps. Try to still see the image of God in that sick we're all sick, we're all suffering, and we all manifest our fallen nature in different ways. Some have worse passions than others. We're all working on our own passions. Some aren't. But we have to still try to see that there's therapy taking place. Hopefully, there's potential for this man or whoever to be healed. Don't ever forget that, that he can still somehow be healed. May it'll leave scars, but, you know, that he can move on to something better than that. Don't f- try to forget the monster and see, you know, the image of God in that person. I don't know. Does any fathers have anything you want to add or pastors who have experience if you like? Have we, anybody else have anything you want to say? That's a difficult one, isn't it? I'm seeking Canadian citizenship if Hillary is elected president. <laughs> Where's the love of there? I don't know. Love for the citizenship. <laughs> okay, uh, the last one I have here, it's 2.30. Can we have time for this? Uh, or you want to start the next session with this? It's up to you. Uh, we'll have, we'll have lunch. You want to wait on this one? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your insight and discussion there. Thank you.